we're, we're old, so we're going to sit. I'll let Odell start. Do you have a mic? You're sitting on the mic. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Odell Richardson, Executive Director of PCSI, Pittsburgh Community Services, Inc. First of all, I was involved with CERR in its inception. It has grown over the last six years. And I think um, what Tim has been able to do with this to keep the conversation going is fantastic. And I just want to give him an acknowledgement for that before we get started. As always with, with the union issue and with the trades, um, there's a conversation and then there's a conversation after the conversation. I had a meeting with Jeff Nobers. It was the first time we met. And uh, he had that meeting as a consequence of CEIR. And we met with Jeff and a couple of leaders from a couple of the trade unions, roofers and the uh, bricklayers, bricklayers, masons. So we had a conversation and they expressed an interest in recruiting and opening up the doors for minorities. And that was the conversation before the conversation. Then we had the conversation after the conversation. Jeff and I, everybody left the room and I shared with Jeff my background experience over the last 40 years in the construction business. I'm an architect and I was involved in commercial construction, primarily in New York, but around the country and around the world. So in 1980, the issues that were faced here in Pittsburgh, where I grew up, this is like 30, 35 years later, it's still going on. And I said, Jeff, I'm willing to work with you because we know and understand the history of the unions and the openness of unions to African Americans in particular. And I told him straight up, he laid waste to that opportunity. There were barriers, there were expressed, there were knockouts. And I said, if you're sincere, I'm going to be sincere and I'm going to work with you. And Jeff said he was sincere. And so we started our campaign, as it were, in December. And then uh, when he locked in the date for the 27th of January, this was really an exploratory uh, event. And one of the things that had not happened historically in Pittsburgh, at least in my time that I was aware of, there were always trade union uh, fairs. Trades would come, show up, but there was never a combination of the trade unions and then the social service or the nonprofit organizations that were in the community addressing the barriers that the trade unions said were knockouts as to reasons why African Americans couldn't participate in the trades. Not having a driver's license, not passing a drug test, not being able to pass a math test, all these things happened in silos of operation. We determined that the best way to do that was to get both parties together and show that the unions were working with those organizations in the community that were working to mitigate the barriers. And that was our campaign. And that's how we started and in January 27th. We had 24 days to promote the event we had, and of course the numbers are, are disputed, but we had in excess of 4,000 people show up that Saturday. It was not advertised as a job fair, it was an information fair. But we had 15 trade unions and 14 social service agencies there, okay? A number of names were collected. We collected 3,000 names. That became, and that's the basis for all of our operations and outreach this year for our workforce development, for our training, for our workshops. And then subsequently, and I'll let uh, Jeff talk about what we've done since then in the numbers, but very quietly, what we're working on behind the scenes, what we've been doing since that event in January. Well, and I think the, uh, <clears throat> the key to that event, and regardless of how many people came, once we got over 800, uh, we were all like, 
holy cow, what's going on here? And uh, so whether that number was 3,000 or 3,600 or 4,000, uh, we know just based on the number of names that were collected, it's at least 3,000. And uh, that was more than three times what we thought we'd get. Uh, people would ask me, how many people do you think are going to show up? I'm like, uh, anywhere from two to a thousand, I really don't know. I mean, you just don't know what's going to go on with these things. Our hope was 700, 750. Uh, so if there was a negative to that day, uh, it was that we were overwhelmed by the number of people that showed up, okay? Um, and I don't know who here in the room may have been there, but, you know, got to be tough to move around and so forth. But I have to say this, uh, to showing the interest level, people stood in those lines. They were very patient. They waited to speak with either the agencies or the trades they wanted to talk to. So I think what that showed to all of us uh, was the great level of interest in those careers and, and the help that could be offered to folks uh, through the various agencies. I know Duquesne University Law School ended up with, what, about 200 folks that signed up for uh, criminal record expungement that day. So, you know, I think bringing those types of services to one place, uh, because there are a lot of groups that are trying to do good things and the right things, but it's all very fractured, too. Uh, you know, you're not quite sure where you're supposed to go for certain things. So for us, as the trades, it was a great, so if we were talking with someone that had a driver's license issue, we didn't have to say, here's a phone number to call or here's a website to go to. We could say, go right over there and talk to that person and they can engage you and start to help you with this driver's license issue. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, we have roughly, uh, Odell and I were talking about this earlier, there's about 200 to 220 folks that are either in a trade union today and working, or they're in process of, of going through the application and the testing. I think you know the one thing that uh, people don't always understand is that there is a, and I don't even want to call it a process, it's timing. Uh, the sprinkler fitters, for example, received eight or 10 applications. They don't start their process till December. Uh, so they have the applications, they have the folks' names, they've talked to them, and when they're ready to do the testing, they're gonna call them all in uh, to do that testing and then go through the interview process. So that's really what slows down uh, to some extent, people getting into trades. Now, a union like the laborers, <clears throat> which basically takes people at all times, uh, we have in the neighborhood of 75 folks from that fair that day are now in the laborers union. They're out somewhere working today uh, throughout Western Pennsylvania. But I think the other thing that came from that is, uh, especially with Odell uh, and some other groups, you know, we built a relationship where we are continuing to recruit uh, minorities into the trades. Uh, you know, we're not doing events where two or 3,000 people show up, uh, but I think, you know, to show how that cooperation works, I called Odell maybe two or three months ago and I said, look, the mason contractors are in great need of mason tenders. Uh, this is a position that pays $23 an hour to start with full medical coverage and pension benefits. Okay, so it's not, a, uh, it's not a bad opportunity, okay, for folks. And uh, I gave uh, Odell the parameters. You know, here's what they need to have. Uh, you know, they have to have transportation. We didn't even ask the driver's license question. We just asked, do you have transportation that you can get to work? Uh, so, you know, they had to have transportation. Uh, they obviously had to have their high school diploma or GED and they had to pass the drug test. And, and to Odell's credit, he said, look, we'll do this. We'll pre-screen the people, we'll vet them, we'll make sure they understand what the opportunity is, and we will drug test them before they even talk to you guys. So that way, anyone you talk to, you know passed a drug test today. And, and I think of the 110 or so, 118? Yeah, that we interviewed over a two-day period uh, from that 118, we went down to 40. And uh, what I can tell you, at, 
some point 23, or 20, I'm sorry, 20 were working for Mason contractors. Three of them have since quit. This is not an easy job. It's a physically demanding job. But 17 are there working today, and of the 17, 16 are African American. Um, so they're making 23 bucks an hour with all those benefits. And even the Mason contractors said, we are so impressed with the staying power and the work ethic uh, because their typical attrition rate at that, in that position is over 60% within the first day, not the first year, the first day. So uh, they were quite impressed with the staying power. So one of the things that uh Jeff didn't say you heard the numbers, right? 85% of the 200 to 220, 90%, 95% of the masonry tenders were black. So very quietly across the trades, we're getting folks into the unions that look like us. There is a way, and by the way, if they get hired by a subcontractor, they automatically go into the union, they become a car carrying journeyman. Doesn't have to do with the application, testing, or anything. If you get employed by a subcontractor who's signatory to a union, they become car carrying members of that union, paying dues and the whole thing. So this is a, a, a work in progress. This is not, we didn't get here overnight. This is a long term process, but it's a steady process and it requires cooperation and partnership, one with the trades. My next exp exploration is to, um, and how I got into the construction industry was actually the side door, dealing with the subcontractors. That's how I got in. That's a vast, vast, vast pool of employers. That's uh, another avenue for getting folks working. So. Well, the one thing I would say, uh, and, and we've had this conversation, uh, the laborers, and I know Walt Bentley's sitting over there, so I'm not beating up the electricians or anything. <laughs> um, but the laborers, the bricklayers, uh, the masons, the roofers, the painters, uh, those unions are what I would say are easier access into the trades. And easier access, meaning that they hire, they don't hire, that they bring people into the programs virtually year round. You know, they're bringing them in as need and market conditions dictate. You know, in the case of the electricians, they take applications once a year in March. And you do your testing in June, April. So you're just now starting to put that class together, right? Okay, so you know if you wanted, you, if you came to me today or to Walt and said I want to be in the electricians, unfortunately you'd have to wait till next March uh, to be able to apply and get into that process. So the point being, uh, you can go into some of these other uh, union trades, especially the laborers, and a lot of people do this. They go in. The laborers sort of cover the waterfront in construction. You're, you're exposed to so many different trades as a laborer. And it's not uncommon for people to be in the laborers for a year or two and then go and apply and move into another trade. Um, and that's perfectly fine. You can almost look at the laborers as sort of like trade college, if you will. Um, you know, we have guys that go into the operating engineers, electricians, carpenters, whatever the case may be, because you can go and apply, continue to work as a laborer, and only when you're accepted into that other apprenticeship program would you then resign from the laborers union and join the other union. Uh, so it's really a good entry point. So I would encourage anyone here, especially those of you that are interacting with, uh, you know, clients or folks that that would be interested in career, a career in the trades, is to keep in mind those particular trades and especially the laborers, uh, so that uh, you know we can get people into the process and into the system, and then they can really understand and explore all the career opportunities that are there. Um, the 
one thing that I, I do want to stress and encourage is it's possible to build relationships with the service, the service providers in the community. It's possible to build relationships with the union. And it's not just the union, but let's think about um, the employers, the subcontractors. That's a whole avenue that really gets ignored, but it, it, it represents a tremendous need for workers. Thank you. So I think if anybody has a question, I think we have about 28 seconds left, right, Richard? Yeah, more or less. Well, well, we're, yeah, at this point, no, we're working uh, at this point on a, a similar event, but what we're trying to do uh, this time around is to make it a two-day event, uh, which would be a Friday, Saturday. Friday would be for the school districts only uh, to bring in, you know, like you saw in the airport video, younger through high school, and then Saturday would be a public event. Uh, where we actually bring in equipment and the demonstration things so people get a more hands-on feel to it. So we've just started to talk about that and, you know, I think within the next month or so we'll have a better, better feel for the plan of action on that.